Hello everyone, welcome to our first lecture in Western Civilization 1500 to present. Uh, we're going to start with the Protestant Reformation. And before we get started, I just kind of want to take a moment to explain um, how you can use these videos. I'm going to lecture for about 20 or 30 minutes on a topic. I always have a, a PowerPoint that goes along with the lecture video. Sometimes I deviate from the PowerPoint a little bit. Um, I might tell a story here or there. Uh, the, so the, the video will not follow the PowerPoint 100%, but if you download the PowerPoint, most of it will match up. So as you're watching these videos, feel free to take notes on your own. Uh, feel free to print off the PowerPoint and take notes as we kind of go along. Um, just use these in whatever way uh, helps you best. Uh, like I said, we're going to start with the Protestant Reformation. I've got a series of three lectures dealing with this. Um, so let me pull up my PowerPoint and we'll get started. All right, so what is the Protestant Reformation? Well, it's one of the biggest watershed moments in Western civilization. Um, if you wanted kind of a textbook definition, you could say it's a split or a schism in the institution of Western Christianity initiated by the, monk, the German monk, Martin Luther. It asks a lot of important questions. Uh, where does authority lie in the Christian church? Uh, is it the Bible? Is it church history and tradition? Uh, who gets to interpret scriptures? Should it be the church or should it be individual believers? How should the Catholic Church be reformed? Uh, one of the big problems is there's a lot of corruption going on. That's kind of why the Protestant Reformation starts. Um, and what is true Christianity? So these, these questions will be with us um, for the next few centuries as we study Western civilization, so kind of keep them in mind. Uh, this split, this Protestant Reformation, also initiated a series of religious wars in Europe throughout the 15 and 1600s. Um, we'll also look at these in a later lecture. Um, we're going to use the word Catholic throughout this, uh, this video lecture, so I just wanted to kind of explain what that means. Um, there's big Catholic, capital C Catholic, and then there's little c Catholic. Before the Protestant Reformation, everyone in Europe would consider themselves Catholic. Catholic just comes from two Greek words, kata and halos, and it just basically means universal. So if you were a Catholic, you belonged to the Universal Church of Christianity. Um, after Martin Luther splits Christianity, uh, Catholics, big C, capital C, referred to themselves as Roman Catholics, and uh, the people that left Catholicism called themselves Protestants. But we'll kind of get into that. So. If I use the word Catholic, it might mean universal, or it can also mean the Roman Catholic Church. You just kind of have to use the context. Um, I've got a couple of maps I want you to look at. If you look at slide three, that's a map of Europe in 1500. There's this big blob in Central Europe called the Holy Roman Empire. That's where most of the story is going to take place with Martin Luther, and then it will spread to the rest of Europe. So if you look at slide three, you can see the map. But then look at slide four, and there's a zoomed-in view of the Holy Roman Empire. You can see how it's not a unified country. The Holy Roman Empire is not a single entity. It's a, a collection of German states, uh, principalities, cities. There's over 300 German rulers in this area. So this is not a unified country, but this is where our story takes place. Uh, the Holy Roman Empire during Martin Luther's day was ruled by Charles V. Uh, he was the king of Spain and the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. So he'll be kind of the, the ruler during this story we're going to kind of get into. Uh, if you look at slide six and seven, you can see there's a map of Europe before the Protestant Reformation. So all of Europe is Catholic. And then you look at afterwards and you can see how there's Catholic, there's Lutheran, there's Calvinist, there, there's Anglican. Um, Lutheran, Calvinist, and Anglican are all Protestant denominations. So basically, after we get done telling the story, Europe is going to be splintered into lots of different religious factions. Okay, so what were some problems going on with the Catholic Church when the Protestant Reformation kind of got underway? Well, there were a lot of problems going on. Um, there was clerical immorality. Priests often had concubines and prostitutes. Um, they got drunk. They gambled. They had children out of wedlock. Um, some of them would, some popes would live as Renaissance princes where they would raise armies and invade others' lands. Some of them built huge castles with cannons on top, uh, so they lived more like a king than a spiritual leader. 
Uh, some of them neglected the poor, worried more about uh, worldly matters. Some of the documents you're going to read this week will kind of uh, give you a feel for that. Uh, there's clerical ignorance. A lot of times priests didn't know what the Bible taught. Uh, they didn't really care about their spiritual duties. They were just in the church to make money. Uh, clerical pluralism was also a problem. What this means is simply, uh, if you were a Catholic official, you could have more than one job at a time. You might be the bishop of this city and then the bishop of this territory. Well, you can't be two places at once. So you're basically not doing your job, but you're getting paid. It would be like being the mayor of uh, New York and uh, Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. at the same time. Uh, you can't obviously do your job in all three places, but you would be getting paid to do the job in all three places. Sometimes you would send someone to do the job in your place, but holding a plurality of offices just basically means you are collecting money for a job you're not doing. Um, there's different popes, and let me explain the picture on slide nine. Uh, the picture on the left, that's Pope uh, Alexander VI. The left side, it says Alexander VI, Pontifex Maximus. And then the picture on the right, it says Ego, Ego Sum Papa. That's Latin for I am your father, and it's a picture of the devil. So basically, this is a Protestant criticism of the Pope. The Pope is more like the devil than like Christ. Um, and on the right, there's a picture of a donkey playing bagpipes. Uh, a lot of times, that's how you would criticize somebody is calling them a donkey. So this is kind of Protestant propaganda against the Catholics. Um, some famous Renaissance, Renaissance popes, Alexander VI, Julius II, Leo X. Um, pope Alexander VI, he had uh, numerous mistresses. Julius II is known as the warrior pope because he raised armies and fought wars. Um, pope Leo X was known for using church funds to build lavish buildings um, and spend it on architecture. So these popes are kind of known for not really focusing on spiritual matters. Now, there were a lot of criticisms of the Catholic Church before Martin Luther. Martin Luther starts the Protestant Reformation in 1517. So Martin Luther kind of gets going in the early 1500s. Centuries before, there were Protestant reformers um, that kind of tried to get things going. Uh, if you look at slide 11, uh, on the left is Francesco Petrarch, um, John Wycliffe, Jan Hus, and Desiderius Erasmus. These were guys that all criticized the Catholic Church for corruption, for focusing on worldly affairs. Um, John Wycliffe and Jan Hus and the rest of them, Pet Petrarch and Erasmus, they wanted the Bible to be in everyone's own language, not just in Latin. Uh, that's a criticism of the Catholic Church. They only have the Bible in Latin. Well, how do you understand the Bible if you're an English or a German speaker? You're not supposed to. The priest is supposed to tell you what it means. You don't read it for yourself. Um, so there were plenty of criticisms before Martin Luther. None of them really caught on, though, the way Martin Luther did. Um, basically, these people wanted less power located in the church hierarchy. Um, you know, if you have the Roman Catholic Church is very hierarchical. You've got popes, you've got bishops, you've got priests, you've got laymen. And basically, there's always somebody above you that you kind of answer to. If we get rid of that, we'll have less corruption. They want less greed in the Catholic Church, more focus on spiritual matters. Uh, they all want a vernacular Bible. Vernacular just means in your own language. So Martin Luther by no means starts everything, but uh, he does kind of, uh, he is the one that splits Christianity, so he's the most famous. Okay, so what did the Catholic Church believe? Um, the Catholic Church believed that you are saved by faith and good works. That's how you get your salvation. The Pope is the representative of Christ on earth. Um, there's a passage in Matthew 16 where Jesus is talking to Peter, and he says, I will give you uh, the keys to heaven. Uh, let me read it here. This is Jesus speaking to Peter. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So Catholics looked at this as proof that Peter was the first Pope. Um, Catholics believe the Bible, church tradition, history, and popes and councils are all sources of authority, and they're all equal. So if you're a Catholic, the Bible, the pope, church councils, church traditions, those are all things that you need to consider when you're determining if something is good in Christianity or 
what Christianity is. You don't just listen to the Bible. You listen to history, tradition, and what the Pope and the councils have to say. Um, there are seven sacraments in the Catholic Church. Baptism, confirmation, the Eucharist, penance, anointing the sick, marriage, and holy orders. Um, the Catholics taught that the Eucharist, that's the, the bread and the wine during communion. They taught that that was literally the body and blood of Jesus. The priest con consecrates that and turns that bread and wine into the, the body and the blood of Jesus. Um, Catholics also have a lot of imagery, statues. Uh, they think that it's good to use these things to teach Christianity. So if you look at slide 13, there's a famous painting. Uh, the painting's by a supporter of Martin Luther, which is kind of ironic, but Martin Luther agreed with Catholics on some things. But this painting on slide 13, it's the Ten Commandments. And if you're a peasant in 1500s Europe, you probably don't know how to read. So uh, pictures are a good way to teach Christianity to you. So if you walked into a Catholic church, there would be tons of stained glass windows, uh, statues, and basically they use this to teach Christianity. Okay, slide 14. These are kind of our main characters, Martin Luther, Pope Leo X. Johann Tetzel, Frederick the Wise, Charles V. If you want to make a, a list on your sheet of paper and write down a few things about each of these individuals, that might help you later on. But basically, I want to get started by kind of telling you the story of Martin Luther. So if you look at slides 15 and 16, there are two different views of Martin Luther. Slide 15 shows a picture of him as this uh, seven-headed beast, the Antichrist. So this is an anti-Martin Luther view. If you look at slide 16, uh, there's Jesus on the cross and Martin Luther is the guy on the farthest right. So this is a kind of a, a very positive view of Martin Luther. So during Martin Luther's day, he was either lifted up as somebody really great or as somebody evil, you know, spreading lies throughout Europe. Uh, Luther was born in Eiselben, Germany. Uh, his mother and father were both peasants. His father did start a... Uh, copper smelting facility. So his father was a little bit more well off later on in life. Um, Martin Luther did not have a good relationship with his parents. Uh, they were both pretty harsh individuals. He said, my father once whipped me so hard I ran away. I hated him. Um, one time his mother beat him because he stole some uh, nuts that she was using to cook with. Um, he said she beat me till the blood flowed. Uh, so he does not have a good relationship with his parents. Um, he has a very good education. Uh, he learned to read and write in Latin. Latin is the official language of the Catholic Church. Um, Latin is kind of the intellectual language of Europe. And keep in mind, during this time, Martin Luther's Catholic. So Martin Luther is a Catholic uh, uh, Christian. Uh, that'll change later on. Um, Martin Luther loved to sing in the choir, go caroling. He played the lute, which is kind of like a, an old medieval guitar. Um, but like I said, he didn't have good relationship with his father and mother. He always needed approval from them. And a lot of historians have basically said Martin Luther's view of God came from his view of his parents. His parents are very harsh. They have a lot of wrath. So Martin Luther kind of projected that on God and grew up thinking that God is kind of a harsh master who punishes you every time you sin and is always, always waiting for you to mess up. Um, he says the severe and harsh life I led with them was the reason that I afterward took refuge in the cloister and became a monk. So one of the themes of Martin Luther's life is he's always trying to, to do good works to make himself uh, more acceptable to God. Um, he goes to university at Erfurt in the early 1500s. He studies Latin, logic, philosophy. Uh, college life was very strict in the Middle Ages, the late Middle Ages. There were set times when you would wake up, go to bed, eat, sleep, pray, study. Um, they don't give you a lot of time to relax because you're there to, to make your mind better. Um, but Martin Luther did like to relax. He would play the lute. Um, he would drink beer. Um, his father actually wanted him to be a lawyer, but he ends up taking a drastic turn. Uh, one day he was traveling back to college. I believe he was visiting his family and he's going back home and he gets caught in this huge thunderstorm. He actually thought he was going to die because the lightning was striking so close to him. And he makes a vow to St. Anne. He says, I will become a monk if you get me out of this storm. Well, he came home and basically he decided to become a monk uh, instead of a lawyer. So he, he disappoints his father. 
Um, and Martin Luther is the one of the best monks you could ever imagine. Um, this is what he says about his own life. He says, I was a pious monk and so strictly observed the rules of my order that if ever a monk got into heaven by monkery, so should I also have gotten there. If it had lasted longer, I should have tortured myself to death with watching, praying, reading, and other, other work. So basically, Martin Luther's theme of his early life is, I've got to do good works to make God pleased with me. Um, his father was not happy when he found out he was going to become a monk. Uh, but, you know, little be known to any of them that Martin Luther was going to make a bigger splash as a monk than he would have as a lawyer. Now, there's also some historical evidence that uh, some of his friends at this time had died from a plague. So Martin Luther is a college student. He has a kind of a near-death experience, and he also has some friends that have died. So, you know, a young person, you start to question your mortality. You start to think about, where am I going when I die? These, these questions plague Martin Luther. So he ends up uh, joining a monastery. Um, uh, the Reformed Congregation of the Eremitical Order of St. Augustine, that's the official name of it. Martin Luther, like I said, was the best monk. He worked hard. He prayed for long hours. Uh, he would beg for food from others so that he kind of shows that he's relying on God to provide, not himself. Uh, he took a vow of poverty. Um, he studied the scriptures very thoroughly. There's an intellectual element to being a monk. You don't just sit in a room all day by yourself. Um, like I said, he thinks that his hard work, his good deeds will lead to his salvation. Um, there's kind of a funny story. He would confess for up to six hours at a time, and somebody would have to listen to him confess. Well, there's a story about how he was confessing to a priest about little things like, oh, I stubbed my toe when I said a curse word, or, you know, somebody took the last piece of bread in the lunch line and I got mad at them. You know, little stuff. And the priest made a joke about, like, why don't you go out and commit adultery or murder somebody, and then you'll have something to actually confess about. So he didn't really mean that, but Martin Luther takes everything pretty seriously. And people kind of get tired of being around him like that. Um, there are stories about him passing out because he's fasting from food for so long, or passing out because he goes out in the cold of winter to kind of uh, show that he's not uh, about having all these pleasures in life. Uh, there's this quote, God's word is too high and too hard for anyone to fulfill. And it is, and it, and this is proved not merely by our Lord's own word, but by my own experience and feeling. So basically Martin Luther knew whatever he was doing, he couldn't quite, uh, be good enough for God. Um, however, irreproachable, irreproachably, I lived as a monk. I could feel myself only as a sinner with a conscience full of guilt, nor could I feel I pleased God with my labor. Indeed, I hated this God, and so I raged against myself with a fierce and troubled conscience. Now, this university professor kind of comes along and helps Martin Luther. Jans von Staupitz, um, you don't have to remember him, but he basically takes Luther under his wing. He makes him a professor of Bible studies, and basically he gives Luther so much work to do that Luther doesn't have time to worry about his soul. Um, Martin Luther once told Staupitz, you're giving me so much work, you're going to kill me. And Staupitz kind of in, in his mind is thinking like, you know, that's the point, sort of. But Staupitz said, don't worry if you die. God has plenty of work for you in heaven. Um, so kind of he thinks he can drown Martin Luther in his work and his teaching uh, responsibilities. And Martin Luther will stop worrying so much. Now, a big moment came in Martin Luther's life in 1510. If you look at slide 38, there's a video clip. I would like you to pause this video and watch that. Um, Martin Luther is sent to Rome by his monastery. Now, Rome is the center of Christianity. It's the center of Catholicism. So Martin Luther, you know, he's kind of a country bumpkin in Germany in the Holy Roman Empire, and now he gets to go to the most important city in Christendom. This is a big deal. But he is comes away totally shocked. He sees all the vices of the Catholic Church on display in Rome, and he comes back questioning his faith. So pause this, watch this clip. It's five or ten minutes, and then you can resume this video. Um, he comes back, does some more studying. Um, Martin Luther loved being a professor. That was kind of, I think, his life's calling. Uh, he gets married later on after he breaks with the Catholic Church, and he would have students come over to dinner, and his wife would have to tell him to shut up so people could eat because he would just talk the whole time and ask them questions. So he loves being a professor. 
But he he starts reading the Bible very thoroughly, and he reads Paul's letter in Romans, and he reads this verse. It says, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is shown through faith for faith. He who is righteous through faith shall live. And this is kind of Luther's aha moment. The light bulb comes on. Basically, Luther sees faith and God's grace as gifts from God. So basically, Luther realizes, I can never be good enough. I can never do enough deeds to earn salvation. Salvation is a free gift from God, and I just have to have faith in God, uh, in, in Jesus Christ dying on the cross. He kind of had this motto, always a sinner, always sorry for your sin, but you're always right with God. And here's a great quote on slide 41. Uh, Martin Luther said, It seemed to me as if I had been born again and as if it had entered and, and as if I had entered paradise through no, newly opened doors. All at once the Bible began to speak in quite a different way to me. The very phrase, the righteousness of God, which I had hated before, was the one now that I love the best. Now, Martin Luther, from this point on, starts to kind of formulate some of his his ideas that will come to dominate Protestant, Protestantism. Now remember, he's still not Protestant, he's a Catholic. But there's something called the three alone. And there's actually two others, but the, these three are the, the important ones. So if you look at slide 42, you need to remember these. Sola fides, sola scriptura, and sola gratia. Sola fides means faith alone. You are saved by faith, not by good works. Sola Scriptura means scriptures alone. That is the only source of authority for Martin Luther. Not the Pope, not the Bishop, not church traditions. It's scripture. And then Sola Gratia just means uh, by grace alone. By grace, by the grace of God, you are saved, not by your own good works. Now there's an event that's coming up that's going to cause Martin Luther to go public with his beliefs. This is going to be the selling of indulgences. And let me just tell you a little bit about indulgences. Basically, um, according to the Catholic Church, Jesus had given Peter and the apostles the power to forgive uh, or withhold forgiveness for sins. Um, this sin or this forgiveness is passed on through something called penance. So let's say you commit a sin. What you're supposed to do is go to the priest and you offer cont contrition. Uh, you basically tell the priest you're sorry. You have to confess and show absolution. Um, the priest declares that you're forgiven by God. Then you have to show that you're serious about your sin by doing something called satisfaction or penance. The priest will give you something to do kind of as a punishment to show that you're really sorry. So if you stole from someone, maybe you have to stand outside the church on Sunday and not go in and you have to wear kind of a black cape over your head. So as people walk in, they recognize that you're kind of, you're being punished because you did something wrong. So basically, you would always have to show that you were really serious about forgiving your, about the sins you committed. Well, in the early 1500s, Pope uh, Leo X has something called the Jubilee Indulgence. Basically, he starts raising money to rebuild St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. So he wants to use this money from these indulgences uh, to to build a building in Rome. And I guess I should say a little bit more about indulgences. Um, let's say you're sorry for your sin and you want to uh, work with the poor. That's probably a good sign that you're serious about your sin. But maybe you don't have time to work with the poor, so you say, can I just give some money to the Catholic Church and they can work with the poor? And that might be okay too. But let's say you get to the point where you don't wanna work with the poor and you don't really care, can't you just give the Catholic Church some money and they'll forgive you? And that's kind of what starts happening is, is some people just start giving money. And another idea in Catholicism is this idea of purgatory. Um, the average Christian won't have made up for all their sins on earth. So when you die, you go to purgatory. And it's basically a place of punishment until you can have all your sins purged from you. That's why it's called purgatory. You might have to spend a year, a hundred years, a thousand years in purgatory before you're good enough to get into heaven. Well, if you buy an indulgence from the church, they will shorten that time in purgatory. They believe they had the power to do this. So people all throughout uh, Europe would, would give the church money and they would get a piece of paper that was an indulgence 
and the priest would write on there, you know, what they did, what they gave the church, that you would put your name on there. And basically, it lessened your time in purgatory. You could also do this for relatives that had already died. If you had a grandparent, you could give some money to the church, and the church would fill out an indulgence, and they would say, your grandparent, you know, got 50 years taken off of purgatory because of your good deed. Well, what ends up happening is this guy named Johann Tetzel, he goes to Germany selling indulgences. Um, he would whip up the people with the descriptions of their loved ones and suffering in pur purgatory. Um, here's kind of a description. Uh, the papal bull, the Pope's document proclaiming the Jubilee indulgence, was carried on a satin or gold embroidered cushion. And all the priests and monks, the town council, schoolmasters, scholars, men, women, and children all went out to meet Tetzel with banners and lighted tapers, with songs and processions. Then all the bells were rung and the organs played. So basically, when Johann Tetzel comes to town selling indulgences, it's kind of like the carnival comes to town. Everyone's excited. Everyone goes out to see him. Um, if you look at slide 48, here's kind of a criticism of Tetzel. Uh, it is incredible what this ignorant monk said and preached. He gave sealed letters stating that even the sins which a man was intending to commit would be forgiven. The Pope, he said, had more power than all the apostles all the angels and saints, more even than the Virgin Mary herself. For these were all subject to Christ, but the Pope was equal to Christ. So there's a problem. If you can get forgiven for sins you're going to commit, you know, maybe you know this Friday you're going to go out with your buddies and do some crazy stuff. Well, just get an indulgence and you can get your future sins forgiven. Johann Tetzel also had this little jingle. Um, Supposedly, he would say, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, at once the soul up to heaven springs. So the minute that money hits his 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 uh, treasure chest, the soul that you're trying to get out of purgatory goes right to heaven. Now, Martin Luther is really upset with this stuff. He believes that God's forgiveness is free. You can't purchase it. So basically, he thinks that Johann Tetzel is leading people astray. You know, he's kind of sending these people to hell because he's teaching them that you can buy God's salvation. When Martin Luther believes it's just your faith in God, it's a free gift from God. You can't buy it. So Martin Luther decides to protest. Now, there's kind of two things he does. He writes a letter to uh, to Albrecht of Mainz, basically saying this is wrong. And he also, this is kind of, some people don't believe this part happened, but it's part of the story. So everyone always tells it this way. But he, he nails 95 theses or arguments on the church door in Wittenberg, Germany. Now, these are in Latin. So these are 95 criticisms of indulgences and of the Catholic Church. They're written in Latin. So they're kind of meant to be an intellectual argument. Um, the church door is kind of like the community bulletin board. So if there was some event coming up, you would put something on the, on the church door. Um, if you look at slide 51, this kind of describes what Martin Luther thought. He said, simple folk believe that when they have bought the indulgence, they have secured their salvation. They believe that the moment the money jingles in the box, souls are delivered from purgatory, and that all sins will be forgiven through a letter of indulgence. Ah, dear God, in this way, the souls who are committed to your care, dear Father, are being led in the paths of death. Christ has nowhere commanded indulgences to be preached, only the gospel. So there's kind of reference to only the Bible is our source of authority, according to Martin Luther. Now, pretty soon, these 95 theses get translated into uh, German. So pretty much everybody starts learning what Martin Luther's criticizing the church about. And a lot of people agree with him. Um, one of the reasons Martin Luther is successful, while those other reformers in the previous hundred years or so weren't, is because the printing press had been... Uh, invented in Germany, the movable type printing press, and it's easy to print pamphlets and spread them around. So Martin Luther's pamphlets get spread all over the place. Um, a lot of people react favorably to this. Um, now, I want to tell you, this is not just a religious issue. It seems like it is, but it's not. If you look at slide 54, all of those indulgences that Johann Tetzel is selling, a lot of those are going to go to Rome, to the Papal States. So if you're a German uh, king or a German nobleman and you control some portion of the Holy Roman Empire, you're not very happy that potential tax revenue is being shifted to Rome. So that's kind of a political element. 
you know, a lot of Germans resent that this money is going to, to Rome to make, you know, Italy richer and not, not Germany. Now, the church deals with Martin Luther in different ways. They, they don't deal with him at the top. They ask the local people in Germany to deal with him. Um, so his Augustinian order is asked to deal with him, um, but they, they can't succeed. Um, later, later on, Luther goes to Augsburg to be interviewed by the Pope's representative, Cardinal Cajetan. Um, this doesn't work. Uh, the Pope's representative tells Martin Luther to renounce your ideas, and Martin Luther refuses to. Um, in uh, 1519, Luther goes to Leipzig, and he's interviewed by Dr. John Eck. Um, this is a public forum. It's a packed house. Luther's college students show up to support him, and, and basically it's a debate between Luther and Eck. Um, and Martin Luther wins a lot of these debates. So the Catholic Church deals with them kind of in a step-by-step -step fashion. Uh, if you look at slide 60, this is kind of a famous, famous quote. Um, it kind of reveals how the people felt about Martin Luther. By now, the whole of Germany is in full revolt. Nine-tenths raise the war cry Luther, while the watchword of the other tenth, who are indifferent to Luther, is death to the Roman Curia. So basically, nine out of ten people support Luther, and the other one hate the Catholic Church. So pretty much everybody's on Luther's side. Uh, in 1520, Luther publishes three uh, very famous pamphlets. Uh, to the Christian nobility of the German nation on the Babylonian captivity of the church concerning Christian liberty. You can kind of read what each of those pamphlets are about, but they kind of lay out Luther's political and religious philosophy. Now, finally, the Pope decides to respond. You know, things are getting serious. A lot of people are starting to, to agree with Luther and, and uh, things are getting out of control. So the Pope issues a papal bull, a papal document, Exerge Domine, um, and the beginning of this document says, Arise, O Lord, a wild boar is seeking to destroy thy vineyard. The wild boar is Martin Luther. Luther has 60 days to give up his ways, or he's going to get excommunicated and declared a heretic. Um, you could be put to death for this. When Martin Luther receives the papal bull, the document, he publicly burns it, and that's an act of defiance. The climax of this uh, battle between Luther and the Catholic Church, who's trying to discipline him, is the Diet of Worms in 1521. You need to remember this. Um, diet just means like an assembly. So this is like an assembly at the town of Worms. Charles V, he's the Holy Roman Emperor and the King of Spain. He's a young guy. He's in his 20s, I believe. He's there. He's kind of going to see what's going on, and he's going to make a decision. Is... Is Martin Luther right and the Catholic Church wrong, or is the Pope right and I need to shut Martin Luther up? Well, what ends up happening is Luther goes there to defend himself. And if you look at slide 68, here's another video clip I would like you to watch. So please just pause this video and click on this. This is, I think, a 10-minute clip, but it shows Martin Luther in front of the emperor. And this movie, I think it's called Luther, is pretty historically accurate. So if you like Martin Luther and you're curious, this is a pretty good movie to watch. Um, but Martin Luther says, Unless I am convicted by the testimony of sacred scripture or by evident reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and council. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to, do, for to go against my conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me, amen. And basically, Charles V decides that uh, Martin Luther is wrong. Um, you can read his response on slide 70. Basically, he says, you know, Martin Luther is a single monk, and he's going against the Pope, the bishops, and, you know, over a thousand years of church history. Obviously, Martin Luther is wrong. You know, Martin Luther versus everything that we know for the last thousand, fifteen hundred years. So Martin Luther, uh, he condemns him as a heretic. Uh, there's a, the Edict of Worms is passed, and it casts Martin Luther as an outlaw. Uh, it says, This devil, the habit of a monk, has brought together ancient errors into one stinking puddle and has invented new ones. His teachings make for rebellion, division, war, murder, robbery, arson, and the collapse of Christendom. We have labored with him, but he recognizes only the authority of Scripture, which he interprets in his own sense. We have given him 21 days. 
Uh, when the time is up, no one is to harbor him. His followers are also to be condemned. His books are to be eradicated from the memory of man. Of man. You shall refuse the, uh, Martin Luther hospitality, lodging, and bed. None shall feed and nourish him with food or drink. Wherever you meet him, you shall take him prisoner and deliver him to us. As for his friends and supporters, we order that you shall attack, overthrow, seize, and wrest their property from them, taking it all into your own possession. Now, you may wonder, Martin Luther's at the, the Diet of Worms. Why don't they just arrest him there? He had been given a, a promise of safe passage to and from the meeting of Diet of Worms. So the, the emperor, Charles V, uh, sticks with his word. He lets Martin Luther leave. But once Martin Luther leaves, then he can get arrested. Now, on the way home, Luther gets kidnapped. And I kind of say kidnapped in, in air quotes. Um, his his uh, friends and some uh, German officials arrange for him to get kidnapped. Uh, Frederick the Wise, he was one of the rulers in Germany. He kind of takes Martin Luther to the Wartburg Castle. Uh, you can see a picture of it on slide 74. Uh, they hide Martin Luther up in there. Martin Luther basically puts on a disguise and he starts calling himself Junker George. Junker is kind of a noble person in Germany, a noble man. Um, so Martin Luther is disguised as this knight, uh, Junker George. Um, while he's at the Wartburg Castle, he's very lonely. Um, he gets ill and depressed, uh, but he works really hard at translating the New Testament into German. He's there for about a year, but things start getting crazy back at home. Um, reforms start taking place. A lot of people start believing with what Martin Luther had done. Um, monks, priests, and nuns start getting married. Um, communion is made less formal. Priests get rid of their fancy clothing and adopt for, uh, very informal dress. Um, windows, pictures, and statutes are smashed. Remember, Catholics think that stained glass window and, and uh, statues kind of tell the story of Christianity, but Protestants, people that follow Luther, see them as idols. Uh, church lands are confiscated. Church schools are shut down. There's some violence. Martin Luther goes back. Uh, and he preaches. He says, I opposed indulgences and all the papists, but never with force. I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. So Martin Luther says, if you're going to reform, that's great, but you can't do it with violence. You know, I put my life on the line to reform the church. I could have raised an army. A lot of people support me, but I didn't. Um, he says, it seems probable that there is danger of an uprising and that priests, monks, bishops, and the entire spiritual estate may be murdered or driven into exile unless they seriously and thoroughly reform themselves. For the common man has been brooding over the injury he has suffered in property, in body, and in soul, and has become provoked. Insurrection is unreasoning and generally hurts the innocent more than the guilty. Hence, no insurrection is ever right, no matter how good the cause and whose interest it is made. The harm resulting from it is it always exceeds the amount of reformation accomplished. My sympathies are and always will be with those against whom insurrection is made. So Luther leaves no doubts he's against uh, a rebellion. Now, there is a rebellion in Germany. It's called the Germans' Peasants' War. It happens around 1424. 1425 is kind of the big year. Um, it's led by a guy named Thomas Munzer. Uh, basically, he calls on the princes of Germany to, to revolt against the Catholic church, clergy. Some of the German princes refuse, so the people start revolting. Um, peasants refuse to pay their taxes, church ties, feudal dues. They attack landlords. They plunder monasteries. Uh, they demand autonomy for their villages and the right to select their own priests. Um, the peasants send Luther a copy of the 12 articles. That's kind of their own declaration of what they want. Um, Luther reads them and responds. He criticizes the German princes. He says, look, you guys have treated the peasants wrong. You need to make it right. But eventually the peasants' revolt gets out of hand and it gets too violent. So then Martin Luther says it's time to, to, to end the rebellion. He writes a pamphlet called against the robbing and murdering hordes of peasants. And you can tell by that title whose side he's on. Martin Luther says, betake themselves to violence and rob and rage and act like mad dogs. That's what the peasants are doing. 
It is the devil's work they are at, and in particular, it is the work of the archdevil Munzer, who rules at Mulhausen. I must begin by setting their sins before them. Then I must instruct the rulers how they are to conduct themselves in these circumstances. Therefore, let everyone who can smite, slay, and stab, secretly or openly, remembering that nothing can be more poisonous, hurtful, hurtful or devilish than a rebel. It is just when one must kill a mad dog. If you do not strike him, he will strike you and the whole land with you. Now, Martin Luther, you know, the princes don't listen to him and go out and kill everybody just because Martin Luther said that. Martin Luther basically was arguing, if you don't stop rebellion and civil war, it will get so out of hand that it's terrible and you need to put it down when it's tiny. And they do. About... 75 to 100,000 German peasants were killed in the in the peasants war so the nobles put down the rebellion. Now in the year 1529 there's something called the Diet of Speyer. Um basically Charles V was willing to negotiate with Protestants. Let's see if we can work out a compromise. Um at this Diet of Speyer in 1529, basically the Catholics and the Protestants get together. The Catholics decide, no, we're going to stick with traditional church teaching. The supporters of Luther, he's not here, it's his supporters, they protest. That's where they get the name Protestants. Protestant just means to protest, so the Diet of Speyer is where they get their name. Uh, later on, there's a Diet at Augsburg in 1530. Um, Charles V still wants to settle this issue. Uh, Martin Luther's, maybe his right-hand man, you could call him Philip Melechthenthal, uh, Melechthon, he draws up a document basically saying this is what Luther believes. Uh, John Eck, he draws up the Catholic reply. Charles V sides with the Catholics. Um, the Protestants are forced to form the Schmalkaldic League. This is just a defensive alliance in Germany. All the Protestants got together and said, we're going to go to war. Charles V is probably going to attack us. We need to defend ourselves. There is a war called the Schmalkaldic Wars. It's basically Charles V and his Catholic allies against German supporters of Luther. Uh, Charles V wins most of these battles, but he can't really totally win. Uh, in 1552, the Peace of Passau is passed, and that ends the Schmalkaldic War. In 1555, the, the big peace settlement is reached. This is the Peace of Augsburg. You really need to remember this. It established the principle. Uh, uh, cuius regio eius religio. That's Latin for whose realm his religion. Remember, the Holy Roman Empire is a bunch of different German territories. So if you're a German prince and you're Protestant, then your followers have to be Protestant. If you're a Catholic prince, your followers have to be Catholic. Let's say you're a Protestant living in a Catholic prince's land. You are allowed to leave and go to a German prince's Protestant land. So they allow people to leave, but basically the only way they can solve this, this issue of violence is saying, let's just let every little territory decide its own religion and then everyone else has to get out. In Germany, typically the North remained Protestant while the South is Catholic. Um, Martin Luther dies in uh, 1546. Um, others would follow in his footsteps, but he's probably the greatest of the Protestant reformers. So just to kind of summarize it up, um, Protestants believe that the, source, the ultimate source of truth is Scripture, whereas Catholics say Scripture, uh, church tradition and history, and the, de the decisions of the, the popes and the councils. Um, Protestants say salvation comes through faith alone. Salvation is the free gift of God. That's just God's grace to you. Catholics say salvation comes from faith and good works. Yes, God is gracious and gives you salvation, but you also have to do things to earn it. Um, Protestants wanted the Bible translated into the vernacular, whereas Catholics want it left in Latin. Um, Protestants want less church hierarchy, less formality. They want stained glass windows gone. They want um, statues gone. They don't believe in all the seven sacraments. Um, Martin Luther he believed in baptism and the Eucharist. Those were the only two sacraments he thought were worth keeping. Um, whereas Catholics, keep all, they want to keep all seven. They want to keep their church hierarchy. Uh, they want to keep kind of the formal dress of the priests. 
Uh, they want to keep everything in Latin. So that's kind of the opening part of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, next video, we'll kind of look and see how it spreads to Switzerland, France, England, some of the other parts of Europe. And then in the third video series, we'll look at the, the religious wars that kind of become out of this, um, and then we'll kind of wrap it up.